Hello and welcome to a very special edition of Talking Honey where we are celebrating Queen Elizabeth in the year of Her Majesty's historic Platinum Jubilee. I'm Shelley Horton and with me is Victoria Arbiter who spent her late teenage years living inside Kensington Palace, former editor-in-chief of the Australian Women's Weekly, Deborah Thomas, and Nine Honey's royal reporter, Natalie Oliveri. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. Hello. The Queen has been at the forefront of the monarchy for 70 years, but in the 1980s, along came another woman whose star power would soon eclipse even that of the monarch. Diana, Princess of Wales, was a breath of fresh air into an institution largely stuck in the past, and her experiences with the royal family would shape the Queen's dealings with the two women to come next, Camilla and Kate. Victoria, first to you. Look, these two women are often portrayed as uh, not getting along, but what do you think about the Queen and Diana? It's extraordinary, really, that that's kind of become the story. But contrary to popular belief, the Queen was very fond of Diana. I think it's fair to say she didn't really relate to her touchy-feely yeah. style, but she recognised its appeal and she recognised how younger people were responding to Diana. And she's never been a dictator. She wants everyone to conduct their role the way they see fit. And Diana was doing a fantastic job. So she was very fond of her. And actually, it was very early on, it was about 1981, she recognised that the press was just becoming so much every day. Diana was on the front pages of the newspaper so she called a meeting at Buckingham Palace for newspaper editors and the goal of the meeting was just to say lay off, just yeah. give her a little room. It's you know it's a lot if someone can't pop out to the store just to pick yes. up a, a packet of sweets. Um, she really tried and yet it was I think less than two months after that meeting that photographs of Diana on holiday in the Bahamas with Prince Charles in a bikini visibly pregnant were splashed across the tabloids mm. and so I think then the royal family were like, we're damned either way. We try and say leave her alone, but actually it just fuels the interest even more. So the efforts were there, but it didn't always pan out well. Well, I mean, they were both very different. If you look at the Queen, traditional and silent, while Diana was very modern and outspoken. So, Deb, how did Diana's fresh approach sit with the Queen and the royal family in the early days? Well, there's no secret that the monarchy were looking to have a more modern um, a appeal to a new generation of, um, mm -hmm. of, of people. Um, and I think that, you know, you've got to look at it a number of ways. Obviously, they were very different in their age. You know, Diana yep. was a different era from the Queen. The Queen had been raised to be the Queen. So she had come from a discipline that was quite unique for any woman. And then there's Diana, who's come from a broken family, she's a young woman, she's 18, 19 years of age, and she hasn't really yet formed who she wants to be. But she's yeah. clearly of another era. She's got a job. She's probably thinking about her career. She's thinking about you know, her future in a completely different light. So two very different backgrounds with very different reasons for being. And then, of course, Diana blossoms into an international celebrity, back to mm. not only the paparazzi, but all of the things, the fascination with her. She was so beautiful. She, you know, she dressed extraordinary in her ch uh, fashion choice. And she became the star. And there was even rumours, remember, that Charles was not happy to be you know, to have his wife yes. out there. When she Second. came to Australia, everybody wanted Diana. Yeah. Now, I think the Queen probably thought that was a good thing, but what happened was they, they got one girl they thought they could control and so many years later realised that they couldn't. Yeah, absolutely. Natalie, it's hard to even believe, but there'll be a generation coming through now that weren't around for Diana. Mm. What do you think was her star quality. What was it about her? Well, I think, as Deb said, she was so beautiful, she was so glamorous, but she was also the ordinary woman, right? Mm. I mean, she came from a noble background, but she wasn't royal. So I think it gave a lot of women the belief that, oh, this could happen to me. And we saw this recently with Crown Princess Mary of Denmark in Australia, right? She married a prince. So it is the fairy tale coming true. I grew up under the spell of Princess Diana. My mm. mother was one of those obsessed with her. So, <laughs> and I mean, she really did spark a new generation of royal watchers, myself included. And my mum tells me stories about seeing Diana in 83, seeing her her mascara in Sydney, oh. seeing her <laughs> perfect complexion. And, you know, I, I have now seen royals myself and you tell these stories to your children, you remember yeah. them forever. And I think it's really nice that Diana is no longer here. However, through her sons, Prince William and Prince Harry, and of course through her grandchildren, her legacy is alive and mm. we can see her, we can see the resemblance of Diana in these children. 
Interestingly, they wanted that more modern um, approach to royalty. But when it happened, there was those huge comparisons yes. to the Queen, and that's where I think it might have been a bit difficult they for the two it, women. They wanted it, they weren't ready for it. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> but, 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 but it also brought to light the criticism of the Queen and how she was had raised yeah. her children. And I think that may have probably not sat comfortably with, with the two women either. Now, Victoria, your dad was the press secretary to the Queen and you said that they, they did try and control the media but they didn't have much luck. But do you think the Queen could have done more to help Diana? I think hindsight is always 2020, and certainly there were things they could have done. Um, I think they tried as best they could, but they were also dealing with someone who had her very own unique way of handling situations. You know, Diana was wonderful. I adored her. I was like Nat's mum. <laughs> I adored her. She could do no wrong. But then you find out much later that actually she was calling the press, and yes. she was sewing little stories about herself, or she was having them come and take pictures of her outside a restaurant, or, you know, so it's very difficult to try and help someone when they're kind of marching to the beat of their own drum. Well, they're not helping as themselves. Well. Exactly. Dad used to say, uh, there was an example where she wanted to invite the one of the British national teams, I think it was the cricket team, to Kensington Palace because they'd done really, really well at a test match and all the staff were going, yes, man, that's wonderful, but then what happens when the English football team does well and the rugby yes. team and the swimming team and the... But she didn't like to be told no. So Diana was an extraordinary being. I think she had so much to offer. There's a reason that we were all so captivated by her. But it was difficult to help when someone would sometimes push that help away mm. as well. And I think Deb hit the nail on the head where she's sort of saying that they wanted that modern mm. era, they wanted this new breath of fresh air, but they didn't quite know what to do with it when they had it. Well, the death of Princess Diana was a turning point for the monarchy and the Queen's handling of the trage tragedy won't really be remembered as the most favourable. But in 2004, Her Majesty paid special tribute to Diana at the opening of a memorial fountain in London. Let's take a look at it. But I cannot forget, and nor can those of us here today who knew her much more personally, as sister, wife, mother or daughter-in-law, the Diana who made such an impact on our lives. Of course, there were difficult times, but memories mellow with the passing of the years. I remember especially the happiness she gave to my two grandsons. And that's an important point, isn't it? It was about the grandsons. Now, the Queen got criticised when uh, she didn't speak out instantly about Diana's death, but she was looking after the boys then. Yeah, I think she went into grandmother mode at that time, and even the Queen's first cousin, Margaret Rhodes, has said that it was the first time in the Queen's life that she was being a proper granny, and that's because she had to deal with, you know, how William and Harry were coping with the loss of their mother. So yeah. they meant much more to the Queen than the public did, unfortunately. And, you, you know, that's why they stayed in Balmoral for so long it took a week for Her Majesty to return to London but you know so many years later the Queen still can't shake that stain on her monarchy mm. I think it still remains a regret how she handled it it's interesting the Queen the movie the one with Helen Mirren mm. tried to change the public perception by having Helen Mirren be a very empathetic Queen right and even still that didn't quite change the public no. opinion which Absolutely. is sad I think so, Victoria, do you think she learnt from that experience that it then impacted the way that she treated Kate and even Meghan? I think everybody learned from that situation. You know, the Queen doesn't want people to fail. She wants them to mm. excel. Prince William actually said she never tells you what to do, but she's quite quick to let you know when she's not terribly pleased with how something <laughs> has gone. But for the most part, everybody is left alone uh, to, to their own devices. But the Queen also likes to lead by example, and I thought it was really charming in 2012, so a year after Kate had married into the family, the Queen went to Fortnum & Mason for an engagement, and she took... Kate and Camilla with her and it was the first time the Queen had ever undertaken an engagement with two future Queen consorts and it was an opportunity for her to lead by example which is how she likes to do things but it also signified her respect and her approval for the two yeah. women waiting in the wings. It was such a charming engagement, you know, they're going shopping together albeit at Fortnum and Mason, it's very fancy but it was such a success that Kate then joined uh, the Queen and Prince Philip for an away day in Leicester a, a week later and the Queen has since done a number of engagements 
arrangements with members of her family and it's something that the Queen Mother wouldn't have necessarily approved of and that's not because right. of any negative feelings towards other members but the Queen Mother was a real stickler for tradition and she believed that if the monarch was there they should be the central focus, they were the star everyone attraction, everyone else steps back. Wow. Whereas suddenly there was the Queen with Kate and Camilla but I think it was uh, the public was ready for that. Again, changes in expectations and yeah. generations and I think it's been really charming to see the Queen do that. So Deb, the Queen has backed Camilla and said that she will be the Queen consort when Prince Charles is King and this has been thanks to a bit of a turnaround and a bit more support for Camilla. What do you think? I was a huge Diana fan and did oh. not like Camilla <laughs> at that particular time but I have got a complete turnaround. I think really? she's, she's really conducted herself very, very well. She's um, clearly, you know, Charles has always been in love with her. The fact was that Charles was forced to marry Diana. Yeah. He was not allowed to marry Camilla because she was, you know, she divorcee. was a divorcee. Um, at the time when they married, there was reports that the Queen says she will never be Queen, and a lot of people going, she will never be Queen, particularly a lot of the Diana fans. But I think that Camilla is intelligent. She's clearly a lot of fun. She's independent. She's been wonderful for Charles. You often see her with the Queen talking and the Queen is having a bit of a laugh. Yeah. I think they get on very well. And I think she's earned the right to be Queen Consort. Mm. Well, the next future Queen Consort after Camilla is the Duchess of Cambridge, who rarely speaks about the Queen. But... For the monarch's 90th birthday, Kate revealed what Her Majesty is like as a grandmother. Take a look. It's very special having a new little girl to, to the family. I feel very, very lucky that George's got a little sister. The Queen, she was really thrilled that it was a little girl. And I think as soon as we came back here to, to Kensington, she was one of our first visitors here. I think she's very fond of Charlotte, always watching what she's up to. George is only two and a half he calls her Gangan. She always leaves a little gift or something in, in their room when we go and, go and stay, and that just shows, I think, her love for her, her family. That's such a grandma thing to do, leave a little present behind. <laughs> um, so do you think the Queen has made an extra effort to help Kate? I certainly think she has. You know, William and Kate have benefited from the fact that William is not yet the Prince of Wales, so there's not the same demands on his time that there were on Charles and Diana when they first married. But I think the Queen shares a very warm relationship with Kate. They have a lot of interests in common, art, nature. Yes. Um, the, the children, of course, photography is a huge mm -hmm. one. The children are an absolute delight. And I thought it was really charming in, uh, when Kate gave one of her very first television interviews was about the Queen and about how she was going to Sandringham for Christmas. I think it was around the Queen's 90th birthday. And she was saying, what do you get the Queen for Christmas? <laughs> and it, a valid question. Um, and so she was thinking about it, thinking about it. And so she decided to make her grandmother's chutney. She used that recipe uh -huh. and she gave it to the Queen. And when she came down to breakfast the next day, that chutney was sitting on the table, which was such a warm gesture. Again, a very family, grandmother, yes. matriarch type thing to do, but something you wouldn't necessarily expect from the Queen, that that might be just tucked away mm. in the royal larder and never to be seen again. But the Queen made sure it was on the table the next morning and I think she's happy to see William so happy. William was allowed to marry for love. He and Kate have been together for mm. an extraordinary number of years before they married and I think the Queen really enjoys that relationship. So Deb, Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, was very critical of the monarchy, alleging that she didn't get much help at all after marrying Prince Harry. Yet the Queen did take Meghan out for some solo engagements like just months after the wedding and it looked like they were pretty tight. What did you read into that? Well, she'd often have her sitting next to her yes. at the races. And they'd and, be laughing. And, and they'd be laughing. And, and I thought that she took her under her wing. I wish Megan would stop whinging, to be honest. Oh! I mean, the fact is that she knew what she was getting into. She was a, you know, she's much older than Diana when she married Charles. Mm. Um, she's an actress, she's American, a whole different way of being. What did she want the Queen to do? Um, you know, what did she expect? Certainly, maybe she could argue that there may have been more help from palace staff if that's what she wanted, but I'm sure as soon as she asked, they would have been there to do that. Mm. So, 
frankly, I think that she's, you know, it's just another reason for her to make a comment, a negative comment about the Queen. But from all of the pictures that I saw and the footage I saw, I thought the Queen really embraced her very beautifully, the, the wedding and all of these sorts of things. And as I say, for goodness sake, could you just find something nice to say? <laughs> <laughs> Nat? <laughs> Look, I, I do agree with a lot of what Deb has said. I mean, even around the wedding when there was all this yes. fiasco about the tiara and whether the Queen wouldn't let her wear a tiara, I mean, a lot of it was probably nonsense. But look, I think, you know, we're going to see something very different from Kate and Camilla. Yes. Because especially Camilla has seen how bad things can get with yes. Diana. So when the time comes, when Camilla is Queen Consort, when Kate is Queen Consort, they are going to be very much following the lead of the Queen who has set the best example possible. They are going to be there supporting their husbands first and foremost. They are going to have an extreme dedication to duty, I think. And also with Kate, she's seen how things can go badly with Meghan yes. too and yes. certainly won't want that to be repeated. So I think the monarchy is in great hands with William and Catherine and also with um, Prince Charles and, and the Duchess of Cornwall. And Meghan can stay in America. On the, with some agitators yeah. on the side. <laughs> some rather Thank you voices. so much to our experts. <laughs> Experts Victoria, Deborah and Natalie for their insights. If you want more royal news, please visit ninehoney.com.au.